Hello everyone, I'm Janet Salmons, Methods Guru for Sage Method Space, and I'm pleased today to be joined by Linda Liebenberg, who is the Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal of Qualitative Methods. And we're going to be talking about research and relevance in today's world. But before we get started, if you are new to Method Space, this is a blog community hosted by Sage Publishing, and we're interested in all things to do with designing, conducting, analyzing research, writing about it, and sharing results in all different kinds of ways. And you can see at the center of this Venn diagram, we have teaching and learning, because we think that whether you are a new researcher, a student, or an experienced researcher, we all have something to learn. So, Linda, why don't you start by telling us about your journal and its mission and goals? Thank you, Janet. Thank you so much for um, including IJQM in this series. Um, IJQM is very much focused on research methods. And as again, as the title of the journal implies, their application across cultures and contexts. Mm -hmm. So we, while the journal has its roots in a Canadian context, we've worked very, very hard, myself and my predecessors have worked very hard to ensure that the journal has an international readership and that we further the use of qualitative methods across diverse settings and um, in diverse contexts to enhance the applicability um, and reputation of qualitative research methods. So with that in mind, a big part of the journal's mission and goal is to provide, um, I'd like to say an interactive space, but we haven't quite achieved that yet, but we're working on it, but a space where researchers can share their experiences in using various qualitative methods, um, ways in which they're pushing the boundaries of using those methods, ways in which they're advancing the methods available to us, or perhaps even developing new methods. Um, and so it's also very much, the journal is very much a site for learning. Um, and again, novice learning, but also continuing education. Well, and, and as an open access journal, you have the ability to reach readers, you know, anyone who has an interest in this topic, and also across disciplines, because it's focused on methods, not on, you know, particular kinds of research. So it's, it's, at this point, uh, for launching 2022, um, method space is going to focus on the topic of research relevance. That's our, mm -hmm. our kind of overarching theme throughout the year. And we want to explore the problems of the greatest scholarly concern and the methodologies and methods and theories um, we need to study them and the ways that we can reach readers of all stripes, you know, to make use of those findings. So given the focus of your journal, could you start mm -hmm. by telling us a little bit about the kinds of problems and issues that are um, attracting your readers at this time? Um, absolutely. I think if the past two years have taught us anything, it's that we can no longer work um, at a snail's pace, if you'd like to share, to do research, and more importantly, to share research findings. At the same time, the past years have really, really taught us the importance of research relevance. And we, I think we really realize um, the significance of research in our communities. And along with that, recognize that we can no longer do research for research sake. Mm -hmm. And so what we're really seeing amongst our readers and our contributing authors is a focus on how do we do research that is A, more relevant to the communities we're working with, and B, can be implemented um, in a timely fashion, but also in a much more flexible and fluid fashion, mm -hmm. given limitations around travel, limitations around social context, 
And so it's really bringing those aspects together. And interestingly, what we see is a real return to almost um, a basic or an implementation of much more basic or fundamental qualitative methods that reconsidered in this new social context that we find ourselves in. So how do we do effective interviews online and in a timely fashion, for example? So, so are, are you seeing more, you know, in terms of the methods and, and the, within the broader qualitative arena, you know, are there particular methodologies that are attracting researchers at this time, either as your contributors or, or readers? Um, I mean, for, for example, I, I see a lot of attention to ethnography, perhaps because, as you say, the interest in the culture and communities, and I see mm -hmm. a lot of uh, attention to case study, but I just wonder what, what do you see? A lot of attention to those approaches, but also how do we use those approaches in a virtual setting? Mm -hmm. um, and so especially approaches such as ethnography, but also um, a lot of arts-based and visual methods, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, which have always blended well with the online world. We see researchers and readers really moving towards those approaches mm -hmm. because they complement one another. Um, and I think can also really support richer research and richer data despite the researcher not actually mm. being able to connect with research participants in their environment in their context so the use of photographs and videos but within mm. an ethnographic framework but absolutely how do we do this online and how do we establish those uh, relationships in a virtual context where you know we can't connect um face to face with right. participants right so do you do you see in terms of you say kind of going back to more of the in some ways going back to more conventional methods but then you know putting them into a new context so by that would you say there is more interest in research with participants versus using uh secondary data or extant data or um, or, or all of the above? All of the above, but really what we're still seeing um, a lot of in our submissions and in our downloads is more that the implementation of research in ways that will develop like primary data and new data. Um, following on that, I think working with extant data through uh, knowledge syntheses and literature reviews, um, we're seeing an, definitely an increase in submissions in that area as well, but not so much working with secondary data. Um, and I think because as qualitative researchers, I think we're still struggling in some ways with in working with secondary data given especially if you haven't been a, if it isn't your data to begin with, mm -hmm. rather than doing a secondary analysis yeah, of your yeah. data if you're working with somebody else's data um, the dynamics of that when you remove that contextual and human element in the narratives mm -hmm. yeah. that's interesting so you mentioned that the timeliness factor, and that was kind of the next thing I wanted to discuss with you, because I think, you know, in this current era where, you know, we're combating all sorts of disinformation and trying to really show the value for rigorous research that, you know, that involves peer review and a revision <laughs> cycle. And so given the time it takes to do that, a couple of things that I, that I wonder about, one is, um, you know, are there, you know, say alternative ways, you know, with, you know, a lot of journals also might have a blog or use social media or whatever to get out, you know, kind of work in progress or, or perhaps having opinion pieces or whatever that, that allow for um, you know, editorial pieces that allow for discussion of, of work in progress, you know, and then also, you know, what, 
you know, what would you advise, you know, to both researchers and to reviewers to help try to expedite that cycle? Um, for researchers, I think it's first and foremost, critically important to become an investigator, become a private investigator, and to look at a journal's website, read up about the journal. Mm -hmm. What are the aims and the goals of the journal? We receive a lot of submissions that report on research findings, and that's not the focus of IJQM. We're interested in the application of methods. And I don't mind those submissions. Um, I find that I'm sometimes being exposed to up and coming publications that I'm excited to read. But I do feel for the authors of those journal articles because the nature of the publication process is such that when it takes, it takes a few hours to submit a journal article through a journal portal. Mm -hmm. That's your time that's being wasted if you're not sort of going in the right direction to begin with. It then takes a few days before a, um, a peer review assistant has vetted the article, made sure you're meeting the journal guidelines. And again, they can, there can be considerable back and forth there if you haven't done your homework. So is this journal appropriate to what you're publishing? And are you submitting a manuscript within the journal's guidelines? So word count, referencing styles, those technical mm -hmm. aspects. So it takes a few days before it even lands on the editor-in-chief's desk. Mm -hmm. And then it goes through that internal vetting process before going out for review. And in that internal vetting reviewing process, if we see that the article is not a good fit for the journal, then it's rejected. And you could have lost a week there in that mm -hmm. process. Um, I say about a week with IJQM, but with other journals, it could be longer. Other journals, it could be shorter. Mm -hmm. But that's a valuable week. Um, so really, really do that homework up front mm -hmm. around the focus mm -hmm. and the intent of the journal before submitting there. And then, as I say, make sure you're submitting within the journal um, guidelines and parameters. Mm -hmm. So that you don't have a back and forth around things like anonymizing your article or word counts. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, if possible, you know, make your article as crisp and clean as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I always advise getting somebody who doesn't know your work very well, mm -hmm. especially a friend or a family member, <laughs> abuse their kindness, to proofread an article before you submit mm -hmm. it. Because if they follow your logic and your argument, you know it's been clearly written. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also just helpful to have a fresh set of eyes, take a look at an article. But the clearer you can make things before it gets to a reviewer's desk, the better. Mm -hmm. It cuts out a lot of unnecessary review feedback. Um, and I think the last point for researchers is to embrace the review process. Uh, to see it as part of your own personal growth and your mm -hmm. learning and development. Mm -hmm. um, I've been very, very lucky to have wonderful reviewers on many of my publications who I really feel through their generosity of feedback have contributed to a final product that was much richer mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. much stronger than what I originally submitted. So embrace the process, but also don't feel beholden to the process. So if you don't agree with something, create a strong argument for why you disagree right. Right. and be respectful in it. This is a peer review process. These are your colleagues that are helping with this. But so the more collegial you can engage, collegially you can engage in the process mm -hmm. as well, the more you're going to streamline things. Oh, and finally for researchers, sorry really prov provide a document of the revisions that you've made that absolutely yeah. highlights them. Use track changes, highlight, include a cover document that's really specific. Mm -hmm. The easier you can make it for the reviewer when it goes back to them, the quicker they're going to turn that document right. around. Right. So really, really highlight those changes and make them crystal clear. For viewers, oh my goodness, COVID has not been kind to the publishing world in terms of reviewers. 
everybody's really struggling with deadlines and workload and finding people to agree to review has become very challenging. Um, but I would say that for reviewers, keep in mind that we're all in the same boat. As a reviewer, again, you're a peer. You have your own journal articles out there for review. So respond to that invitation to review as if it was for your article. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, in responding respectfully to think about if you really don't have time in the next two weeks to review an article, will you really have time in the mm -hmm. next four weeks? Mm -hmm. What is happening in the next two weeks that's preventing you from engaging that manuscript almost immediately? Um, so, and I personally have become very strict about that. If I don't have time to review an article in the next week, I rather say no, because it's not fair. Right. Um, and to also, if you receive an invitation to review a manuscript, respond expediently. Um, you know when that invitation lands in your email inbox, if you have time or not. Just click on decline if you can't, so that the journal can move on right. to move finding on. others. Right. Exactly, exactly. So, um, and if you, for some reason, if you've said yes, and for some reason you're seeing that you're just not getting to the review, be sure to communicate with the journal editor and to just explain you are doing it, but please could you have a week or two extension? Um, because I find on our team, we get we start getting a little anxious about should we be finding another reviewer or not? And you also don't know, has this reviewer started a review? Are we going to be wasting their time as well if we rescind the invitation? And we don't want to do that. So, yeah, I think just respond in a timely fashion. And if something does delay your review, to communicate that, that's really helpful. So it, it's kind of a, a different angle on that. You know, are, are there other ways that you think, you know, whether they're, you know, currently in use or, or ideas you might have for people to, to get potential, you know, like, let's say, for example, you know, I've got five recommendations that are going to be, you know, really useful to, you know, my readership, but, you know, it's going to take me another six months to get this whole thing wrapped up. But in the meantime, is there a way that I can, you know, just thinking about, you know, the urgency of, you know, so many of the problems that we are facing, I think, you know, the problems that, you know, in the in the schools and communities and, you know, if there, if you've got something that might help, you know, how can we get it out there, you know, while we are also, uh, you know, kind of going through the more scholarly process um, through, you know, academic blogs, you know, social media posts, or just, um, you know, here are five tips for teachers or, you know, whatever that, you know, might be able to, to uh, contribute. Absolutely. Um, and I think especially your teacher example is excellent because um, as academics, we barely have time to read academic journal articles. Right. So people in other professions are not reading academic journal articles. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, um, I think tweeting, you know, um, five tips for engaging learners in classrooms or, you know, a tip a day on, on, you know, on some kind, for mm -hmm. example, Twitter, around connecting with research participants um, in a virtual setting, you know, to get those tips out in those avenues. Um, something that I know a lot of my colleagues have used in, in their work in the past and that I've used as well is to share tip sheets. Uh, colleagues of mine in New Zealand do a lot of work around service provision. So sharing uh, just a one pager tip sheet with frontline mm -hmm. service providers. Um, and what's beautiful is that these kinds of dissemination, sort of like mini dissemination ideas that can be shared on social media can often come out of the journal writing process. So as you're writing up those findings, how do you translate what you're saying into pithy one-liners mm -hmm. that are concrete, 
clear and easy to digest by knowledge users. Um, and simultaneously in recognizing what the need is uh, by, of knowledge users, that can also inform the kinds of journal articles we're writing. Mm -hmm. So these two products can really complement each other and inform each other very creatively um, throughout the process. And that's also a very handy way of not having to wait until research is finished. Um, I did research several years ago with a group of young people in a small rural community and it was participatory action research for the group of youth. And in hanging out around the research and mm -hmm. just chatting, the youth described the kind of youth center they would like to see in their community. And that was the kind of information I could go back to the service provider with immediately. Yeah. Yeah. And within months, that knowledge was actually put into action while we were still gathering data and analyzing yeah. data. Yeah. So I think to think about findings and knowledge differently, it doesn't always have to be a big overarching theory. Mm -hmm. um, similarly with methods, we don't always have to invent something new and fabulous. It really could just be, wow, I did these semi-structured interviews in this particular way with this particular mm -hmm. group of people and it seems to have worked. Um, and to reflect on that, those fieldwork experiences can be shared before data is analyzed. Um, yeah. I also think. <coughs> so tell us a little bit about what you have planned for 2022. Do you, do you have any special issues or uh, editorial priorities that readers would be interested to hear about? Absolutely. Um, and actually, our special issue and priorities dovetail very well with your questions and focus this year. Um, so we're busy finalizing a special issue focused on social impact. And we're thrilled to have had a special contribution by Donna Mertens on social impact as well. So using qualitative methods to enhance the social impact of findings. And what's wonderful with the issue is the way in which it highlights how we have to con so carefully consider the research process in its entirety to make sure that those findings and that knowledge coming out in the end are going to be impactful and have the best uh, relevance for communities. So we're very excited about that um, special issue. And similarly, um, the editorial priorities for the year are to really consider exactly that issue of social impact of qualitative research. Um, and thinking about a lot of the issues that your questions have raised here today. So how do we um, do field work that continues to produce rich and relevant data, despite the limitations that we're consistently coming up against um, with each new wave? And, um, so how do we maintain that? Uh, and concomitantly, how do we how do we better align our research focus with communities, with community needs? How do we know we're using the right qualitative methods in that process? Um, what about our analysis processes? Are we using the right approach to analysis? Are we using that approach correctly? And what are we doing with our findings? Um, at the end of the day, how are we sharing them? Where are we sharing them? Do we limit them to academic journals or do we uh, have more of a multi-pronged approach where we're sharing those findings in much more digestible ways and sharing them with appropriate audiences? Um, I think that's a big question that's coming up as well and that we'd like to focus on. Um, just putting the information out there doesn't necessarily mean it has been shared and doesn't mean that knowledge users are necessarily 
connecting with that work? And even if they are, are they using it? Is there uptake of the knowledge that's been shared? And so we'd really like to bring a much richer discussion into the journal focused on that. How do we make sure we're sharing findings in ways that have better impact and better uptake? Well, we will certainly uh, feature the journal throughout the year and uh, draw attention to some of those um, articles and approaches. It almost sounds like you're doing research about the journal while you're while you're uh, offering it. So it should be an exciting year. So th thank you so much. Uh, is there is there anything else that you would like to add before we close? Um. Yes, and I think just uh, a, like a final tip for all authors out there and even reviewers, never hesitate to contact the editor of a journal, um, Never, especially if you have an idea. We recently published um, a commentary on an article, and again, it, or a commentary, at, we recently published the commentary, I should say, mm -hmm. not necessarily on an article, but the intent really was, again, as a means of getting information out more expediently. And I've also had, especially younger researchers, novice researchers reach out to me with ideas um, for where I said, well, we could do this as an editorial and it would come out mm -hmm. really quickly. Similarly, I've had novice researchers contact me to ask if they could share something as an editorial, but the idea has been so rich and, and fabulous that I said, no, this really should be um, a full article. Um, so reach out to editors about that, and especially in an open access environment, it is expensive to publish in open access. Um, but it's such a worthwhile space to be in, especially yeah. if you want your work to be far reaching. So again, don't hesitate to contact an editor and explain your situation and see what options exist to either get a, a discount or if there are any supports, rather than just um, discounting the journal and saying, well, I can't afford that and walking away. Contact the editor. Yeah. Well, that's uh, great advice, and I hope that our um, method space readers will take it and, and submit some uh, some fabulous uh, contributions. So uh, thank you again. Um, it's very, I think you've given us some, some really uh, substantive advice. So thanks a lot.